Last Sabbath, I talked about the principles of the kingdom of God and how it relates to family. Uh, to be to have a successful family, it, there has to be employment, meaning there has to be gainful employment. What is gainful employment? Something that is fulfilling to you and glorifying to God. Stop clocking in at a place that you don't want to be at or change your attitude. One or the other, because it does not please the Lord if you're working in an environment where he, you are not fulfilled and he is not glorified. Also, you've got to be engaged in making an impact in the world around you. Your family is called by God to make an impact in the world around you. If all your family does is come home and eat and watch TV and clean up and you're not engaged in making an impact in the world around you, you, my friend, are not fulfilling the call of God on your life as a member of a family. Now, family does not just mean if you've got a husband or a wife or children. Family is your household. So if it's just you and your house, you need to be the impact. All right? And then thirdly, families are order. They have order in them. You cannot glorify God in a nasty house. Uh-oh. Come on. I know we don't want to hear it, folks, but guess what? God is a God of order. There is no scripture in all of the Bible that says cleanliness is next to godliness. There's no scripture. But what there is is a principle that God is a God of order. As a matter of fact, when the children of Israel left Egypt, they were so used to dealing with the flesh pots of Egypt, God gave them instruction on how to keep their camps clean. He told Moses how to lay out the camps. Jethro was inspired by the Spirit of God to give instruction to Moses so that the camp would be laid out. Clean up your house and you will experience a fresh presence of the angels of the Lord as they come to minister to you. Everybody's quiet on that. Everybody's quiet. I better not preach about clean houses. If you think that's bad, wait until next month when I talk about the health message. All month I'm talking about health. So y'all better get all the scrimp and catfish and chitterlings you want to get out of your way. Because all month I'm talking about health and the power of someone whose body is fit for the use of God. And I'm including myself, you know, because I know people that are vegetarians, but they're mean-spirited. And so when I talk about health, I'm talking about spiritual and physical health. Then I know people who are vegans, but they look so sick and their skin is almost green. Something wrong with that, Jack. You got you to gotta have balance in your life. Yeah, there has to be balance and temperance, and it's got to come together for a, the glory of God. Everything we do should be to the glory of God. Here, following up from last week, and I try not to preach in series because that means if you miss one part of the series, you don't get the full import of the message. But this is a sermon in and of itself. The sermon is titled, How to Get Demons Out of Your House. How to Get Demons Out of of what? Out of your house. Here the Bible gives us instances over and over again of what a demon is and where demons come from. First and foremost, I want you to turn with me to the book of John. What book did I say? John. the book of John chapter 5. I'm sorry, in the book of Luke chapter 4, I'm jumping ahead. Luke chapter 4. No, if I say what book did I say, say, you said John, but you said now you're trying to go to Luke. But here, let's go to Luke chapter 4. I apologize. The book of Luke chapter 4 and verse 33. Luke chapter 4 and verse 33. First and foremost, I want to establish that there was a war in heaven. And Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And the dragon is that serpent of old, which is called the devil, Lucifer, Lux Pharaoh, the son of the morning. He was cast out to the earth like a bolt of lightning and a crash of thunder. Lucifer was cast to the earth and he went to make war with the remnant of Christ's seed. In other words, he went to establish his kingdom on an earth that was a part of the kingdom of God. 
Right now, there is something going on called the great controversy. In many instances, it is unseen, but when you talk about demons and you talk about angels, there are the unseen actions of demons, and there are the seen actions of demons. For the context of our message today, when I reference demons, I'm talking about spiritual strongholds. A spiritual stronghold is something that happens in your life, to your life, by your life, that you seem to not have control over. And while you are an independent thinker, it seems as though you are being controlled by something else. And I'm not talking about those times when you say the devil made me do it because the devil doesn't make us do anything. But there are principles at play in our lives that will put us under the control of Satan. And by our choices, our actions, or the habits thereof, we find ourselves as agents of the devil. And so here, when your house is infested with demons, it's one thing to be infested with roaches you call orkin. But there are principles in scripture that you call on when your house is infested with demons. Demons come in all types of forms. They are spiritual strongholds, therefore spiritual in nature. A demon is a fallen angel, a creature once of light, now a creature of darkness. And a demon has the power to influence your life just as sure as the Spirit of God has the power to influence your life. And whichever you yield your heart to, that is which way your life will be serving. There is no such thing as someone that serves God halfway, nor is there such thing as someone that serves the devil halfway. You can only serve all of God all of the time with all of you. Or you serve all of the devil all of the time with all of your heart. There is no middle ground. It does not exist. It is not present. There is no indication in all of Scripture that you can do one or the other without only doing one or the other. And so here in Luke chapter 4, we begin in the synagogue. The synagogue was the meeting place of the people of God. It is where they came to acknowledge his presence in their lives and on the earth. It is where they came to acknowledge that he was sovereign, that he was ruler, that he was in control. The synagogue was, in fact, the abiding place of the presence of God. It was a safe place. It was a place where you knew spiritual things were taking place. But how many of you know that the devil can go to church, too? We're talking about our homes. By the end of this month, sermons I hope that we will have stronger homes, homes of impact, homes of order, homes that are glorifying to God because we are gainfully employed. And I can't tell you how many people wrote me notes or sent text messages when I talk about that principle of being gainfully employed. Do not work in an environment that you don't want to be in unless you're willing to equip yourself to be what God wants you to be. Here and in the synagogue, there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice saying, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him saying, hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this, for with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the fame of him went about into every place of the country round about. Here, Jesus is in the synagogue. Jesus is in the what? So we know the synagogue is the place where spiritual things happen, and we know the ruler of all things spiritual, Jesus Christ, is there. He is the sovereign God, although he is an incarnate form. He is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was the son of God, but he was the co-eternal part of the Trinity that also meant he was God. But the Bible says that here in the synagogue, in the house of the Lord, in the house of the Lord, Jesus is also there, but the Bible identifies a third party present in the synagogue. 
Bible says that there is a man with an unclean spirit. Now, if I were to ask you a question, what is an unclean spirit? Some will say, oh, it's a bad attitude, or it's cursing, or it's drinking, or it's, it's fornicating, or it's adultery, or it's lying, or it's cheating, or it's any of those things. Well, well, the truth of the matter is, is that, and are you ready for this? An unclean spirit is anything that is contrary to God. Some of us, you see, have little things in our lives called little sins or sins that we're still working on. But what we don't understand is, is that if God does not have full control of our hearts, that means a little bit of unclean spirits are in us. Because an unclean spirit is anything that is contrary to the will of God. God is light and light dispels darkness. Therefore, you cannot have darkness if there is what? Because light and darkness can't abide in the same place. So if there's a little bit of darkness, there's no light. You see, oftentimes we confuse the spirit of God with our own preferences, our own ideas about who he is and what he does. Even in raising our children, we subscribe to notions and child rearing that have nothing to do with the word of God. I used to preach about being a parent and I remember someone walked up to me once and said, when Carla was pregnant with Riley, she said, that little girl is going to show you what it really means to be a parent. Because you think that it's as easy as saying what the word of God says. And I tell you, she was right. <laughs> Parenting is not that easy. There are things that make sense to me that just don't make sense to my daughter. There are things that I, I try to teach or what Carla tries to teach that don't come across the way we want them to come across. And it is not as simple, but it doesn't mean that we just give up and let the child win. Because when we satisfy the qualms of the child's heart or the wishes of the child's heart, what we are doing is saying that you are your own God. But in parenting, we have to guide a child. We have to direct a child. And no matter how tired we get, we've got to continue to do that so that the child will grow up in the fear of God. And guess what? One writer says, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that we are the first gods our children will ever meet. Doesn't mean we are gods. It means that our children see God in us. And so if all your child knows is beat and spank and whoop and corner and slap and fuss, they will grow up to be brawlers. If your child knows a loving word, a kind sentiment, a compassionate heart, they will grow up to recognize that Jesus was leading your life and your decisions. Child, children need discipline. They need to know the borders that are afforded them. As a matter of fact, every study shows as it relates to children and, and following the rules, that children prefer rules. I had a nephew, his name, I have a nephew, his name is Christian. Christian is 13 years old. And I remember when Christian was about seven years old, Christian wanted to color, and, and Christian wouldn't color in the lines. And, and I, I don't have a problem with children not coloring in the lines. I don't think I colored in the lines at any point ever in my life. Even if a grade was attached to it, I would put one dot out of the line just simply because I wanted to indicate that I am not bound by the line. My teachers tell us you can be anything. By the time you get in 12th grade, well, just get your, you know, just get some kind of job. You go from being the president of the world to being, listen, you just want to get a job. They lie to you. They, for the first six years of school, they tell you you can do anything. For the last six years, they want you to know that's not true. I wish I could have started my life in seventh grade. I would have really been somebody. Because I would have believed in myself. But here, Christian was coloring, and I noticed that he kept going out of the lines. I said, you know what I'm going to do, Chris? call him Chris. I said, I'm going to go and get you some other paper that you can color. And I got some paper that didn't have any pictures on it. There was nothing to be colored in, nothing to be filled in. And I gave him the paper. I said, you can color this how you want. And after a while, he said, Uncle John, can I color the other coloring book? Can I have the pictures? And I said, Chris, why do you want the pictures? I, I made it so that you don't even have to worry about the lines. Because you could tell he was worried about the lines a little bit. 
I said, you don't even have to worry about the lines. Chris said to me, and I will never forget, he must have been six or seven years old. Chris said, but Uncle John, I like to know where the lines are, even if I don't want to color in them. Here, what I'm saying to you is that children like to know what their borders are. But their borders have to be created by love. They have to be created by compassion. And through an exegesis, through further study, this person in Luke chapter 4 and verse 33, he recognized the lines, but he consistently worked out of them. In other words, I'm saying to you that the demons did not just come and take over his life. The demons did not just come and take control of who he was. He worked so far out of the lines for so long that he created a habit of surrender to the devil. And in creating a habit of surrendering to the devil, he opened his own life up to the full control of the enemy of our souls. It's quite similar when we follow the Holy Spirit. There are times when people say things to us and we don't respond the way we used to respond. Why do we not respond the way we used to respond? Because the Holy Spirit is taking control of our lives. Is he making us do the right thing? No, but because we've surrendered to him in habit, because there's a fervent, perpetual, ongoing spirit of righteousness, we yield to the spirit and he is allowed to take control of our lives why when you practice things that are not in the will of God and you do things that are not in the will of God and you say, but this is just the way I am, what you're really saying is, is I was born in sin, shaping in iniquity, and I'm going to stay in sin and grow in iniquity. And so here, the first principle that I want you to understand about demons being in your house is that just because you and your family attend church doesn't mean the devil is not in control of your life. Just because you are a member of a local church, whether Seventh-day Adventist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, Lutheran, or whatever denomination you want to subscribe to, it does not mean that the devil is not in control of your life. Just as sure as Jesus shows up in church, the devil shows up in church. And so the idea is not to try to figure out how to get people out of the church because the wheat and the tares will always grow together until the Lord returns. It is not for you to determine who should be in and out of the church. Because the truth of the matter is, if you start trying to pick out wheat and tares, you might be the tares trying to choke out the wheat. You didn't get that, so I'm going to say it again. I have found that the people that want the other people out are the wrong people in the first place. And what do weeds do? They grow. They choke. They kill. They take over. And so in your life, the idea is not how do you fix the church. The idea is how do I fix my home? Because the wheat and tares will always grow together. So don't come with the notion or the idea that all of a sudden there's something that can happen to make the church full of righteous people. The church will never be full of righteous people. That will never be the case. That's why we've got to serve people where they are, no matter how they treat us. You got to love them. You got to go to their bedside. You got to pray for them. And let me tell you, the best prayer to pray for your enemy is the prayer for God to bless them. Because if the blessings get so great, they won't have time to deal with you. Lord, pour out blessings on their lives so that there's not room enough to receive it, God. Lord, anoint them. Lord, give them power. Give them a promotion on their job. Give them a nice car. Give them a nice house. Give them strength in their life, Lord. Because if they've got that, they don't want me. Oh, come on. And so here the first principle is that, and I want to establish this as I talk about family, is that just because you're in the house of God doesn't mean the house of God is in you. And that principle rings true. And that principle is very simple here in Luke chapter 4 and verse 33, that in the synagogue there was a man with an unclean spirit. You see, that unclean spirit lay host. How many of you know that one demon is like a gateway demon? Oh, uh, you never, you've heard the term gateway. You've heard weed is a gateway drug. How many of you know what I mean when I say that? Because you've tried it. That's right. There we go. There we go. Amen. Amen. Amen for each of you. Amen. I saw you, Calvin. Calvin was like, no, 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 no. 
Calvin, it's like he was exercising. He said, oh, yes, just roll it around. Here, a gateway drug is, in other words, a drug that may not be as hard, a substance that may not be, may, may not, possibly is not as damaging as, as others, but because you try this substance, it opens your life to other substances that will inevitably ruin who you are. Well, a gateway demon, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. A gateway demon is a little demon. It is a demon that does not have power like the other demons. It is a demon that is not as easily discernible as the demons that can do the most damage in your life. But the gateway demons open the door to let other demons in. That is why when this one gateway demon in the man spoke and said to Jesus, we know who you are. We recognize you as the son of God. We remember what it was like to abide in your presence and to worship your holy name. That one gateway demon opened the door and told all of the other demons that Jesus was in the house. And all of the demons cried out and said, leave us alone. The day of judgment is not yet come. We know you are the son of God. And Jesus told him to be quiet. He says, I want y'all to calm down because everybody else needs to learn who I am. Since you know who I am, I'm going to exorcise you from this person. I'm going to remove you because the devil recognized Jesus in you before you recognize Jesus in you. The devil knows what God is doing in you before you know what God is doing in you. It's no wonder you got fired on your job. It's no wonder your car broke down. It's no wonder your bank account is empty. It's no wonder your income tax has not come. Because the devil knows that God is doing something in your life, over your life, through your life, for your life, by your life, to your life. The devil begins to call it out. He begins to recognize it. And here, how does this translate into the home life? How does this translate into the family? Well, first and foremost, just because you're in the church doesn't mean God is the ruler of your life. Secondly, it is the little things that make the difference in your home. Now, I'm going to bold, and I won't hit every pin, even though I'm trying to. But it's the nature of bowling that you aim to knock them all down, but you only hit some. And so while I am bowling, I am also a pin. And I desire to be knocked down by the overwhelming grace of God. So I am not apologizing for what I am about to say, but do not take offense to it without deciding, deciding to repent from it. Because offense without repentance is an offense. Offense with repentance is deliverance. Little demons look like ghosts in the bathroom on Harry Potter. Oh. Oh, my goodness. I got to step down for this. Little demons are magic wands that create dresses for Cinderella. Oh, oh, my goodness. Can I sit in my office and preach this? Will my mic work back there? Little demons are shows that emulate a lifestyle you do not live. As a matter of fact, your life is in contradiction to. Little demons are scandals and empires. Scott, you just come finish this sermon for me. You just... Come on, you just finished this sermon. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Scott said, I'm ready. In season and out of season, I will reprove and rebuke all these sinners. <laughs> as long as your phone don't ring in church, we all right. Little demons, my friend, and I, I say it so that it's easier to digest 
and I'm guilty. I have things in my life that are little demons, and I think I can hold them at bay. But how many of you know you can't hold the devil at bay? You, you cannot create an environment that the devil cannot get into. As a matter of fact, you've got to guard the avenues of your soul. Because the things that you let in, the little demons you let in, keep you stuck. When you try to get away from the big demons, the little demons hold you down. So the big demons can kick you in the gut. So in your home, a little magic here, a little sorcery there, a little occult here, a little no devotion there, a little eat what you want here, a little go where you want there. Those are the little things that open you up to be like the man in the synagogue who was completely overrun by demons in his life. They're called unclean spirits. Here, I confess to you, I used to love the walking dead. I told you. I had people come to me and say, man, pastor, but it's not real. I said, I know, so why you watch it? I was watching. I knew it wasn't real. I said the same thing. The idea is that you want to try to overcome new sins. Don't be in the same stuff you've been in for years. You better get you some new problems. I'm serious. You better say, look, I got problems, but it's not the ones I had last year. I got issues, but at least it's not the ones I had last week. I'm messed up, but not by the same stuff that messed me up this morning. Man, I like my praise team. They just amening over there. I'm about to, I'm about to start coming on Friday night to preach to them. And so here, what I'm saying to you is that, you see, bitter and sweet water don't come out of the same spring. In other words, the, 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 the core of who we are, if it is not fully surrendered and controlled by the spirit of the living God, then it is fully controlled and surrendered to the enemy of our soul. The man who was possessed by a demon in the synagogue he was not possessed by a demon in the synagogue because one day he went out and he all of a sudden got mugged by a demon. No. What happened was, as we understand, in context and inspired writing, he stayed away from his family for extended periods of time. He was dishonest about his whereabouts. He was not faithful in his finances. We're not just talking tithe and offering because, you know, you can give a faithful tithe and offering based on the church, but God does not accept it because it's not the first fruits of your labor. Oh, you didn't hear what I said? I said first fruits. If it is not the first fruits, the church will take it and we will cash it. But only you know if God has accepted it. And how do you know God has accepted it? You stop getting them phone calls because he keeps the devourer at bay. Your money lasts as long as the days in the month because he keeps the devourer at bay. There are people who are faithful in tithe and offering, and they are not faithful stewards over their resources at home. Wife doesn't know what's going on. Husband doesn't know what's going on. Children are destitute, neglected, and left without. Husband feels like his wife's responsibility. Wife feels like his husband's responsibility. You're letting little demons in, and they're running rampant in your house. They're overtaking your children. That's why you can raise a child for 15, 16 years, and all of a sudden, in one month, two months, three months, you don't even recognize them anymore because little demons have finally taken control. And so here, this man was not faithful in his resources at home. He would stay out. He would be dishonest about what he was doing. He began associating with people that did not desire to please God. And while he offered his sacrifices and attended the worship experiences and the festivals of the Jewish nation, he associated in the day-to-day the -day with people that had no intent to honor God. Because how many of you know birds of a feather flock together? I try to hang with people that are better than me. So if I hang with you, it's because I think you're better than me. That's why I hang with Joe. He's better than me. 
That's why I call Elder Harrison and Elder Harrison. They're better than me. I call Elder Jackson. I want to be around people better than me. I don't want to be around people. So if I don't hang with you, <laughs> but that's why I hang with all my members. But y'all ain't better than me. But here, the principle is in this man's life is that he began to surround himself in the carnal world, in the physical world, with things that were not helping him in the spiritual world. And if you are surrounding yourself with things in the physical world that do not help you in the spiritual world, what is happening is, is you are surrounding your heart with things that are detra detracting from the will of God. So if you find yourself moved away out of his presence. So here now, Jesus, when he rebukes him, he does something that is unusual for Jesus to do. In all of the other instances of Jesus exercising a demon, demons actually have discourse with the Son of God. Like, for instance, uh, in, in the Gadarenes, on the other side of the Sea of Galilee in Genesaret, when Jesus exercised the two demoniacs who were living in the tombstones. And I don't have time to go to that story, but how many of you know that the devil will have you living in an environment surrounded by dead stuff? You're in an emotionally, that's, oh, Lord. Mm. Your relationship in your marriage is emotionally dead. You are socially dead on your job because you don't want to be there. You have no connection with your church and you are spiritually dead. You're living in a graveyard. That's why you've got to be fulfilled by what you do. I'm so here, it sure did get quiet, CJ. I better get off of that real quick. Here, when Jesus exercised the demoniac, the demons out of the men at the, uh, in Genesaret on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, this is just after he had walked on the water and calmed the storm, and this is just after he had fed the 5,000. So Jesus goes from miracle to miracle. He feeds 5,000 men, not including women and children. Some theologians believe that there must have been 12,000 people there that day that Jesus fed with two fish and five loaves of bread. As a matter of fact, the two fish weren't exactly two whole fish. They were like a fish relish that was spread, a fish spread, spread over the bread. Jesus fed 12,000 people with fish bread and spread. Then he tells the disciples to go over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And in the middle of a storm, Jesus walks on the water and then tells Peter to walk on the water too. It's one thing to have power for yourself. It's another thing to have power you can give to other people. And then after all of that goes on, Jesus comes to the other side in Genesaret and the gatherings. And when he gets out of the boat, two demons run at him. And all the disciples run away. He's just a miracle worker. And Jesus says to the men to come out, and the demon said, but this is not the day of judgment, Jesus. You shouldn't cast us out. We know we're going to burn in hell's fire, which is an indication that hell's fire is not currently burning right now. It is not a present hell. It is a future hell. Uh-oh, can we get some theology? Meaning hell is going to come. As I surely see to say, I don't want to live in hell and die and go to hell. But here, when he exercised those demons, those demons pleaded with him not to be cast out. And the demons put up a fight. And so Jesus cast the demons into a herd of swine, and the swine ran off of the cliff. I've been to this area. It's a limestone, hilly area, and the demons could not come back. He cast them out. But these demons did not put up a fight. The Bible says, as a matter of fact, Jesus shut them up and exercised them from the men so that they wouldn't do any more damage than they had already done. The Bible indicates that Jesus had the power over them, that the devil that he had thrown in the midst, that the devil and the demons that had been thrown in the midst came out and they didn't even hurt the man. So here, an additional principle in your family is that you cannot exercise demons on your own. You can have all the virgin olive oil, extra virgin olive oil you want. But the demon in you knows the demon in there. And it's so easy to be demons. Y'all didn't get that. 
But here I'm winding down, and you're talking about getting demons out of your house, Pastor. You've, you've identified that demons are real. You've identified that demons exist. You've identified that they are spiritual powers over our lives and that little things open ourselves to these spiritual powers, and we've got to be diligent in guarding the avenue of our soul and protecting the avenue of our mind and what we watch and what we hear and what we say and what we think and what we do. But here, Pastor, how do I get the demons out of my house? First and foremost, you've got to accept that only Jesus can. The Bible says that if we are faithful and just to com confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, one principle in overcoming demons in your house is you've got to overcome demons in your life. First and foremost, sins come in by, demons come in by acts of sin. What did I say? You're trying to figure out why you can't have intimacy with your wife. It is because of the pornography on your computer. Demons come in by acts of sin. Demons come in by acts of sin. You're trying to figure out why you can't connect with your husband. It is because emotionally you are not available to your husband. You are available to your coworker. That's called an emotional affair. You're trying to figure out why you can't connect with your children. It is because deep down inside you feel a responsibility that you are rejecting to take care of your children. You've got to step into your children's world to raise your children. Your children don't have to be like you. They don't have to think like you. They just have to do what you tell them to do. But when you're raising your children, you can't try to raise yourself. Riley is not a miniature me. Matter of fact, I don't want her to be a miniature me. So here, what you've got to understand is that demons come in by acts of sin. You've got to overcome sin in your life if you want to get the demons out of your house. How many of you know that Christ has the power to exercise any demon out of our lives? He has the power to overcome any demon in our homes. As a matter of fact, demons in our lives come in all forms. There is a demon of lack of intimacy. In a marriage, there is a demon that prevents you from being intimate with your spouse because that demon knows that if you were to connect with your spouse on an intimate level, not just physically but emotionally and spiritually connect with your spouse, you will be a force to be reckoned with. So the demon drives a wedge between you and your spouse so that you cannot connect with them intimately. Meaning you're there, but more than anything else, you're just roommates paying bills under the same roof. You're co-parenting, but you're not raising your child as one. There's that demon. Then there's the demon of depression. And there are people that can clock in every day at work. They can go to work. They can take care of their house. But all they do is work, go home, maybe go to church. They close the curtains. They close the blinds. They put the car in the garage. Nobody knows them. Nobody cares. You could be dead in your house for three weeks. Ain't nobody going to check on you but the church because we only got to see you once a week. But because you're not living a life of impact, because you're not making a difference in the world around you, no one cares what's going on in your life. Because you're living through a depression and the devil has separated you from the purpose of God in your life. Because the devil knows if you ever knocked on that neighbor's door, they would give their life to Jesus Christ. Then there's another demon that, in my opinion, is probably the most difficult foe for us to deal with. And that is the demon of arrogance. The demon of arrogance is the demon that makes you think that all of the problems in the house are your wife's problems or your wife caused it or it's her fault. And that demon comes and goes and he only messes with your head when you are in the midst of conflict. When everything is messing up in the world around you, that demon will make you think that what's going on is your partner's fault when God sent your partner to help you. So that devil has you thinking that your partner is your enemy. And he turns you on each other. And the devil has you getting messed up at church, messed up on your job, messed up with your money, and messed up in your bedroom. He has convinced you that you are in a battle against the very people that love you the most. And if you're not married, if you're not married... That demon will affect your relationship with your siblings, with your friends. How you been friends for 30 years, and all of a sudden your friend is your enemy because the devil has taken control. The devil comes in to steal, to kill, and to destroy. 
And I believe that the demon of arrogance is the most difficult and dangerous demon that any of us can face. Because the Bible tells us very plainly and clearly, pride comes before a fall. Here, my friend, and I'm closing. We've been trying to get out of church at 1230. It's just not going to work. Either we're too black or we're too good. One or the other is not going to work. As I close this morning, to overcome the demons in your house, you've got to overcome the demons in your heart. It is not a long and lengthy process. As a matter of fact, it is just one word from the Lord. How many did I say? I said it's just one word from the Lord. All the Lord has to do is say, come out. And every demon in hell cannot prevail in your life. All the Lord has to do is say, come out. How do I get the Lord to speak in my life? How do I get the Lord to speak over my life? How do I get the Lord to demand and command the demons that have bound me for so long to get out of my life, to get out of my heart, to get out of my mind, to get out of my house? How do I do that? The Bible tells us very plainly and clearly. It's, very, it's a simple process. It's a simple process. He says, if anybody's thirsty, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. He says, I am the bread of life. Any man that eats this bread will never hunger again. He says, if you confess your sins, I'm faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever believe, believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God did not come into the world to condemn it but to save it. It's simply calling on Jesus. It's calling on Jesus and saying, Jesus, I want to be free from this. I've been bound before. There are things in my life right now as pastor that I struggle with, and I'm cognizant of the fact that if I don't overcome them, I will not make it. But it is a struggle worth struggling for. Because the eternal weight of salvation is far greater than the things of this world. And so I'm telling you, that when Jesus speaks in your life, he will calm everything that the devil has stirred up. Now, when the demons are exercised from your heart, then comes the hard part, getting them out of your house. Because just because the devil is no longer a resident of your heart, it does not mean he is no longer a resident of your house. So that's where you go into intercession. Jesus said to Peter, he said, Peter... You know what Peter means? It means rock. He said, Peter, the devil desires to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. Here, my friend, intercession is a powerful tool to overcome demons in your house. You can put the oil down, okay? You can put the oil down. And what you need to do is go clean out that closet. Move all the shoes and the clothes to one side. And go to the side you've cleaned out and close the door. Because the Lord who hears in secret shall reward you openly. And when you pray, don't pray like the publicans and the tax collectors who come to go through the form and fashion of spirituality. When you pray, confess your sins before the Lord. Don't you pray one of those mamby-pamby prayers, God forgive me for what is known and what is unknown. You better say, Lord, deliver me from pornography. Deliver me from lying, from cheating, from stealing, from adultery, whatever it is in your life. You better pray. And once you fully confess to the Lord and he has broken your heart, then you are a free agent to pray for your loved ones. And you start asking God to forgive you for how you treated your spouse. Start asking God to forgive you for how you mistreated your husband, how you mistreated your wife. You're not praying for God to change their mind. You're asking God to forgive you for how you messed theirs up. Once you've prayed that prayer, then you begin to pray a very specific prayer over the lives of your loved ones. You say, Lord, I take responsibility for my actions and deterring them from the path you have ordained for their life. And men, you need to be leading them. Men, husbands, fathers, you need to go home today and get in that closet. 
Forget dinner. Forget all your preparations. You need to leave this church and go home because what would happen in a church if every man and father was the priest of their home? But this is the very specific prayer you pray. You say, Lord, I pray that no demon will ever have power over me again. And when my spouse acts the way I have acted towards them all this time, help me to humble down. Help me to meek, to be meek. Help me to have a mild spirit. Help me to humble down. Lord, when my spouse begins to complain, help me to serve them. Until I have served them so much that I fill the void in their lives with the compassion that you showed your disciples in the upper room. Find yourself a basin, spiritually speaking. Find yourself a towel and serve. When your spouse comes in cussing and fussing, figure out how you can get down and serve them even more. When your spouse comes in complaining and, and conniving, when they come in drunk and when they come in high, figure out how you can fill that void. Figure out how you can get low and get under them. so that You can get to the foundation of who they are and you can repair the brokenness of the foundation. What will happen is you repair the entire structure of the home. How do I get demons out of my house, get them out of my heart? By confessing to the Lord. How do I get demons out of my house? Begin a process of intercession where you've confessed your sins and you begin to pray for your loved ones and you begin to ask God to help you to serve them, no matter how you're treated. And finally, my friend, this is a very simple truth. The Bible says, all you have to do is believe. Because if you don't believe it's going to work, you will be rewarded for your faith. The Bible says you've got to believe. Are demons real? Yes. Are spiritual strongholds real? Yes. Does the devil sometimes do things in your home that you don't deserve? Yes, he does. But the truth of the matter is, is that when Christ gets a hold of your house, through your own heart, the work that Christ does is greater than any of the damage that the devil has ever done. And so today, every eye is closed, every head is bowed. Something real soft, gentlemen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for hearing our prayer today. And God, we ask now that you would begin to touch every heart in this sanctuary. Lord, I pray from the pulpit to every pew that you would help us to overcome the demons that have bound our lives for so long. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us to not only overcome the demons, but to help us overcome ourselves. Deliver us from the spirit of arrogance and the spirit of depression and, and all of those evil things that has us bound. And Lord, I pray that this message fall on fertile ground, takes root and reaps a mighty harvest of families that are demon free. And Father, in the name of Jesus, if there's someone under the sound of my voice that desires to surrender to the Lord in baptism today, I ask you, Lord, to move them out of their seat right now and bring them to the altar. Today, you sense the Lord is calling you to surrender in baptism. Whomever you are, I invite you to move to the altar right now. The Lord is calling your name. This may be an opportunity for you to overcome something that otherwise you would not overcome. This is where you practice faithfulness to God. If he is calling you, if he's saying move, if he's saying get out of your seat, if there's anything in you telling you to do that, I'm telling you that is the spirit of the living God. And I invite you to move to this altar right now. Whomever you are, I'm inviting you to move to this altar right now. Now I know you sense it and I sense it. We need to pray for families, elders. And folks, all of us, pastor and elders, we're all struggling with this, all of us. But elders, I'm asking you to come and stand across the front of this sanctuary as prayer warriors right now. Every elder, every elder, I'm asking you to stand across the front of this sanctuary right now. Pastor Hayes, why don't you come and help us if you can? If you can. Pastor Johnson, whomever you are, just come, just come. All the elders, you're standing across the front of this sanctuary. 
Now I know full well that we've got some families that want to surrender to the Lord today. They want to say, Father, bless my house, deliver my house. So every head of household or every wife or mother, or woman, husband, that desires for a prayer to be prayed over your house, for a prayer to be prayed over your family, over your life, over your children, I invite you to come to the altar right now. I want you to get your spouse. If your spouse is here, if that's uncomfortable, that's okay. You just come. You make the move. And elders, I want you to pray for them. Don't pray God bless them. Pray for them. Pray for them as they come. Just pray as they come. Just hold them. Bring them to you. Bring them to you and pray with them as they come. Bring them to you. Pray with them individually and then go on to the next family. Pray with them individually and then go on to the next family. Pray with them individually, each family alone, and then go to the next family. You pray with one family, and then you go on to the next family. You pray with one family, and then you go to the next family.